there was this species of mussel mytilus. This is an Indo-Pacific barnacle. About six months later, I was doing some field work in Liverpool, and this is a breakwater in Liverpool, and there's this barnacle called Alminius, and there's this mussel called Mytilus. So you've got this sort of global homogenisation. You know, I tend to think of Mytilus as being sort of like the, you know, the Big Mac of the mussel world. It's everywhere. And maybe Alminius is a bit like Kentucky Fried Chicken. And they're everywhere. They're not particularly good, but they just happen to be everywhere. Um, so you've got this global homogenisation occurring due to our amazing ability to shift things around the globe. And yeah, Britain used to be a great exporting nation before we went down this mantra of service industries and all that bullshit. Um, and, you know, and one of our greatest exports was the, the shore crab, or I think it's called the green crab over here. And that's got everywhere. You know, we've, it's Australia, South Africa, it's the dominant predator around here. It scares Jeff's mollusks. Um, <laughs> Makes them get shells thicker and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, that's a really successful British export, but it doesn't often mess up the systems in which it comes because it beats up all the other crabs. It's a bit of a skinhead, really. Um, but sadly, these days, we're great, we're great importers because we don't make anything anymore. So a lot of our trade used to be with the US, and um, we imported uh, the uh, salt marsh grass, Spartina, which was... Um, pretty promiscuous, interbred with one of our local seagrasses, and then formed a whole new species, Spartina anglica, which has taken over everywhere now. So that was an un unexpected twist. Crepidula fornicata came in on the east coast of, of Britain in the 1890s. It was brought in with um, Virginian oysters that were brought in because the oyster fishery had been fished out in the UK. So they said, hey, let's bring in some oysters from those unexploited populations in Chesapeake Bay. It's changed a bit since then. And of course, lots of other pests came in with them. And the Slip Olympic, Crepidula fornicata, um, got to Southampton in about 1913. Um, in recent years, all those Toyotas and Hondas have brought in lots of other stuff in the, in the ballast water. Um, and Sargassum muticum actually came in on a second wave of importation of oysters with the, with the Pacific oyster um, Crassostria gigas into France, got over to Britain in about 1973 and everywhere. And this is a, well, quite a cute tunicate uh, sea squirt which has come in in recent years. But you can see the acceleration of, of species coming in you know, due to just pr pretty sloppy work really with ballast water and biosecurity. Um, so a real pace of change and Southampton is still one of the major seaports in the UK. And round here there's lots of interesting invasives, Hemigrapsis, Carcinus. The major grazer here is actually an import um, from, from, from Europe, though there's some argument about this, and also major seaweed has came over at some stage in the last century. So a lot of the intertidal in New England and in, in the Canadian Maritimes is actually quite, inter, quite an artificial assemblage. And we've already talked about plastic litter. It's everywhere. Some of my, one of my colleagues, Richard Thompson at the University of Plymouth, has worked with Mark Brown and others and has done some really interesting work on the ecotoxicology of this. And you've got these sort of, you know, Sylvia showed fantastic pictures of the Sargasso Sea last year, and we've got sort of this punk Sargasso Sea in some places taking its place. And you get some surprising local impacts. Um, one of my colleagues in North Wales showed this. This is an interesting disturbance event in the Ascophyllum zone. And um, I suspect that actually alcohol was probably the ultimate cause of this disturbance event. So, you know, all sorts of things happen that cause disturbances. Anyway, I'm now going to talk about work that, that I was involved in. And it involves a huge, a, a huge group of, of people, some of which are threatening to see this on live streaming back in the UK at the moment. But they've probably got better things to do, and it's a bit early over there. Um, and one person I really want to mention is Alan Southwood, because for many years he was the steward of, of long-term data sets. And what we did was actually restart much of his work. So I had the privilege to be director of this lab, the Marine Biological Association of the United Kingdom, for eight years between 1999 and 2007. And being a 100-year-plus institution, 125 years actually, the association's been in existence. There's a lot of really long-term data sets. And there's a lot of talk about data availability and data stewardship and archiving. And the MBA had a really good data stewardship policy. Don't chuck anything away. 
And a lot of the data I'm going to talk about we actually found in cupboards, and actually I, I used to I saved some of it for being chucked on the skip at one stage. And we found a lot of copper plate notebooks written in 1909 with fish species that have been caught. Um, and we managed to get those into modern computer systems. We also found a lot of data on obsolete magnetic tape that we couldn't do anything with, so fortunately we hadn't chucked the notebooks away and we could re-enter the data because it was quicker than trying to find uh, a big IBM computer from the 1970s to uh, get the data available. So what I'm going to talk about is restarting the long time series, separation of climate from fishing, a bit about rocky shore indicators, and a little bit of modelling to try to move from forecast to prediction, and then some comments about adapting to climate change. So when we started working in Plymouth in the 1887, ahead of, the year ahead of building the lab, fishing was, was very much a, a craft. Sailboats, this is the Plymouth fishing fleet, and we think this is one of the early MBA vessels. Um, you can tell the difference between the public sector and the private sector in the levels of overmanning um, <laughs> in this particular boat. Uh, but, but these guys are having a lot more fun than these poor buggers who are trying to earn a living uh, by catching herring. Um, this is the legs of the lady I referred to previously, and um, Stanhope Forbes was part of the Newland Realism School of Painting, and in fact things like the common skate were common then, they're now biologically extinct in the English Channel um, due to overfishing. So, you know, fishing was a craft, and there was some, still some quite big fish in the English Channel. Fortunately, marine sampling hasn't changed very much over the last hundred years. You sort of stick nets over the side, you get expensive bits of equipment and you lose them, and hopefully you, you, um, you sort of curate the data. So the first systematic observations started in 1902 as part of the International Council for Exploration of the Seas uh, investigations, which was to address the issue of overfishing in the North Sea, which was apparent from the 1890s onwards. And a lot of data has been collected. A lot of it stopped in the 1980s, which was the last time of uh, financial constraints in the United Kingdom, when uh, this long-time work was viewed as not being hypothesis-driven research, and a lot of it was cut. Um, I, I managed with colleagues to restart a lot of this work um, from a variety of different funds. So we've got some of these long-term data sets, but there's many gaps in these, in these series. War, funding cuts, changes in scientific fashion, and other things. So this is 100 years of data from 1905 to 2005. Um, there was a cold period around the turn of the, of the last century. It got progressively warmer up to the 1950s. There was then a notoriously cool period of the 60s, 70s and 80s. And then about 1987, just when all the long time observations were stopped, there was a very rapid period of warming. And the last few years it actually got a bit colder again as we've hit some NEO negative winters. You can also see the challenge. This is weather and the curve is climate and it's very difficult segregating out short term noise from longer term low amplitude signal and that's why you need long term data sets. Now the British Isles are particularly sensitive to climate change because they're on a biogeographic boundary and Edward Forbes who is famous for the Azoic hypothesis actually got biogeography right um, and he <laughs> said quite early on that to the south and west of Britain was a lot of warm water species and to the north and east were a lot of cold water species. Uh, we now know from modern genetics that a lot of these cold water species actually invaded the North Atlantic from the Pacific about three to four million years ago during the last time the Northwest Passage was open for a long time. So I think there's going to be major evolutionary changes of that opening. So there's a sort of a collision of southern and northern clades uh, through the British Isles. And let's have a look at some fish. So herring are a northern species, pilchards, or these days they're called sardines, are um, a southern species. And if we look at some long-term data, the herring fishery collapsed in Plymouth. It was massive, and it collapsed over a five-year period in the 1930s. And due to other observations, due to plankton, we think this is due to um, climate-driven change uh, rather than overfishing. And in recent years, pilchards are much, much more common. Interestingly, when the herring collapsed, pilchers didn't feature in the, um, very much in the catches in the 1950s. But if you look at planktonic data, there were vast numbers of pilchard eggs 
um, actually in the plankton at that time, there was just no market for pilchards. It was only when they got rebranded as sardines in the 1990s that uh, marketing took off because everybody had been on holiday in Spain and Portugal and had sardina grelada and it was suddenly a fashionable thing to eat. Um, so you've got to be very careful using fisheries catch statistics because they're not just driven by fish abundance but they're also driven by market forces. And we know these fluctuations go back to the Middle Ages. We know that during cold periods, herring dominated, and during warm periods, pilchard dominated from customs books and other records. So these fluctuations go back a long time. So with our, with our fish time series, which is well, it's more like a series of episodes rather than the time series, we've got some data either side of the First World War, a lot of work in the 50s, a lot of work in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And then um, I restarted this work in the 2000s. And you've got a climate signal. These are warm water species, typical of what you might eat on holiday in Spain and Portugal. Not very common either side of the First World War. Quite common in the warm 50s, much less common in the 70s and 80s. And then when we started fishing, we started hitting quite large numbers of them. So this family of, species, this family of fish is very much a climate-driven signal. This group of fish though, this is very much a fishing signal and interestingly stuff done in 1909 and 1910 there was already signs of overfishing and this was only after 20 years of steam trawling in the English Channel and after four years of no fishing because of U-boats in the English Channel, stuff like that um, the skate recovered but then since then there's been decline. These fish get to sexual maturity in a, uh, at this size in about three or four years, they only have 50 or 60 young a year they're incredibly vulnerable to overfishing, and uh, you can see that uh, with, the, uh, with the time series. Um, when we analysed the data, there was a strong climate signal, um, strong enough to get it published in a reasonably decent journal. And um, so there's, 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 there's clearly, there's, there's, there's really climate driving what's going on. But the other thing is fishing. And, this is a picture of the, the decks of the MBA fishing boat in the 1960s, which we found in the archive. And this is when we, we started the work in 2001. You will note it's the same mesh size net with a covered cod end. So these are fisheries independent surveys um, done on the same grounds in a very similar way. And just look at the size of the fish in the 1960s compared to the size of the fish in 2000. So this is better than any multi-dimensional scaling analysis in terms of uh, getting over the effects of completely restructuring of the assemblage. So we got a few more years data um, and, we were, and we recently published another paper in Global Change Biology which showed that the small species actually tracked climate quite nicely but we could find no pattern with the larger species and the guy who led this work, Martin Jenner, did a really neat analysis where he looked at the rate of change um, in size against the theoretical maximum body size of the, of, of the fish um, with about 60 species for which there was sufficient data. And the interesting thing is, at about three fish that, whose maximum body size is about three kilos, that's a fish about that sort of size, um, fishing completely truncates out the climate signal. These, all these big species are declining because of fishing. Whereas the small species are surprisingly resilient and are, and, are, and are not changing very much over time at all. So, lots of changes, strong interaction of climate and fishing. Pelagic species particularly fluctuate um, and they're driven by climate change and um, a, a really strong effect on the bottom fish assemblage. Interestingly, advanced the southern species, but many of the northern species seem to be persisting as well. So getting to my first love, rocky shore ecology, again we're very fortunate to have records from the 40s and 50s by people like Dennis Crisp, Alan Southwood, and in, and in France, going right the way down to um, French North Africa from uh, Fisher Piet. So we've got a fantastic baseline of mapping intertidal species. And the data from the 50s are particularly valuable because that was the last warm period. Uh, Jack Lewis and team did a lot of work in the 70s and 80s, and Alan Southwood in particular kept some time series going from the 1950s to 1987, um, when he was prematurely made redundant. And I've got stuff which um, goes from 1980 uh, right up to date, and I'll be doing some of this work on, on Saturday.
So rocky shore surveys are, are, are cheap, well, sort of cost effective. It's a lot cheaper than going out in a boat and spending lots of money. And it's a really good way of getting data. And we've got huge broad scale data sets all around the UK and also in Ireland, which we resurveyed. And we found lots of changes. Um, this is a species that goes from Senegal up to Scotland. And when we resurveyed up in 2000, we found that this species, uh, the range of this species had extended along the north coast and it was actually reproducing and recruiting along here. And we found this for several other species. The range of these species has extended um, of these southern ones. Now, after the last ice age, most of these species would have expanded north and reinvaded northern Europe and the British Isles as the ice came off. And some would have gone this way, and some would have gone this way into the sort of colder, enclosed North Sea. This species used to stop here and used to stop here. It had sort of gone that way around the coast and that way around the coast. But we actually found that on artificial substrates, it had managed to get all the way around the British Isles um, due to a combination of better recruitment and also lots of substrate provided by things like harbours and sea defences. So lots of southern species advancing and a few northern species decreasing in abundance. But most of the retreats have been uh, recorded much further south. So David Weathy and colleagues have shown retreats further south down in Spain and Portugal of this particular species. So we've got quantitative data for these barnacles and there's some sort of arcane identification skills involved to tell the difference between northern species, this species occurs outside uh, here in, in, in New England as well, and southern species such as these two cathalamid species. The, the red felt tip dot pet helps as well to tell you that's Cathalamus stellatus <laughs> and that's Cathalamus montagua. Um, this is a training tool. Um, Alan Southwood kept these time series going for 50 odd years, uh, 40 odd years and during the warm 1950s the southern species did well uh, during the cool 60s the northern species came back and then declined and then there was a bit of a gap and I restarted doing counts in 1997 and I found that the southern species was at sort of higher levels than it had been at the peak of the warm period interestingly the northern species was, was less abundant but was still persisting and this is one shore that we managed to keep going throughout the whole period. You can see the warm species doing well in the 50s, the southern species declining during the cool 60s, the northern species doing well, then replacement, and in recent years it's done pretty well. And this is an Australian immigrant coming in and beginning to take a foothold um, in, in the assemblage. Southampton, where I work now, um, is another boundary zone and many species used to stop between Portland Bill and, um, and, uh, and the Isle of Wight due to hydrographic factors. Steve Gaines has done similar work in, in California with larvae being lost offshore and for many many years this was a stable boundary zone but when we redid some surveys in 2004 we found a whole range of species had the range of, of these species had extended along the south coast. Um, the one exception being patella depressor this doesn't disperse very well, and it never made it to Ireland after the last ice age, and it sort of made a rather pathetic 15-kilometre jump um, off the Isle of Wight. Though last year I did find one here when doing some field work. So you've got very idiosyncratic reactions of different species depending on their life history characteristics, their dispersal capability, and also how fussy they are about, uh, about habitat. But why were these things progressing? Well. The southeast of England is sort of slowly sinking. Scotland's all right because it's rebounding after the last ice age. But you know, with rising and stormier seas, the southeast of England is subsiding. So there's a huge amount of coastal defences that have been built on the south coast, and these are fantastic stepping stones for species to be able to ex for, to be able to extend and for the ranges to, to, to colonise and for the ranges to extend along the south coast. So. Um, I think this has been a major factor in some of these range extensions because you know, there's a big gap, there's hard rock here, not very much here, and these species basically hopped along a combination of sea defences, and, and this species is particularly fond of seaside piers, and um, there's a lot of those on the south coast, and they, sort of, they, 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 they like seaside piers and they, they hop along on those. So we've done some, I mean it's quite good fun going out and looking at these things, but we've also done a bit of hard science as well. Um, so with, with Avira Poliskanska and Mike Burrows at SAMS, we took 
Allen's long-term data set, and we did some, um, some quite complex statistical analysis and some modelling. And um, we are interested in the interactions between the northern and the southern species in areas where they overlapped. And we used data from 30 shores around the UK. And um, we use surface sea surface temperature um, as a proxy for general climatic conditions. And Mike found that there was a very good correlation with the previous June. So there was a negative correlation with warm weather the previous June for the northern species and a positive correlation for the southern species. But Mike looked at it in a bit more detail. And there's a very strong direct relationship between temperature and the northern species, both high on the shore and in the middle of the shore, but not a very strong direct relationship with the cathalamids. But what's happening is that in warmer years, the, the northern species, which is the competitive dominant, uh, doesn't do so well, and cathalamus is actually released from competition. So you've got an indirect effect to climate. Um, warmer weather is actually releasing the less competitive southern species from competition from the, uh, the, 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 the competitively superior northern species. And um, using a, a version of the rough garden uh, model, we... Um, we modelled the, the, the dynamics of the, of the populations and um, we hindcasted it. We tested the data against Alan Southwood's 40 year data set. And we, we did various versions of the model. We, want, we had one which just had physics in it, which was driven by temperature, worked great for the northern species but was rubbish for the southern species. And we built in competition, space limited competition, which worked quite well for the northern species and not so bad for the southern species, so we, we adopted that model. And then we used different emission scenarios to see what would happen to this species, which was the dominant barnacle in the 30s and 40s in the English Channel, and showed that eventually, even under low emissions, it would probably not do so well and would certainly go extinct. And meanwhile, the southern species would come to dominate. I mean, this basically is telling you that the shores of Britain will become like the shores of Portugal and Spain in about 30 years' time, with these southern species predominating and the northern species going extinct. Now, you might say, why barnacles? But the same things will be going on with less tractable species offshore, with fish, with benthos that you can't do experiments with. So these are a good proxy to get an idea about general interactions, because we know so much about barnacle biology from uh, generations of experiment and uh, manipulation on the shore. 30 minutes. Thanks very much. So the key message from that really is even under low submissions, the dominant species would be very rare. And it's an indirect effect to climate change because it's release of the southern species from competition from the competitive northern species. So another aspect of um, climate change is um, rising and stormier seas. This is another one of my long-term study sites at Porth Leven, where the Torrey Canyon uh, tanker went down in 1967. Um, and in response to this pressure on the coast, there's been an awful lot of um, engineering going on, hardening the coastline, and you get all sorts of nice constructions. There was obviously a lot of money in the 70s to spent to pour concrete, and you get these nice wavy ones, you get a lot of r rubble, uh, Y-shaped groins, shore parallel structures, all sorts of stuff. And 33% of the soft coast in England and Wales has now got artificial hardening of some, some nature. And, you know, in some cases, it's justified. I mean, th all these houses were built before there were planning regulations in the, ni in the 1930s. They wouldn't be allowed now. But without these breakwaters, these, these houses were worth nothing. Um, and uh, this has allowed them to not get flooded quite so often. Um, in the Mediterranean, there's an awful lot of sea defences that are built. And it's partly to protect property. But in many cases, it's to ensure that there's nice sandy beaches um, for people to... Um, to, to be tourists on and if we were to do you know, Google Street View here we'd see probably lots of semi-naked Germans at the moment <laughs> uh, so we've been, we've been involved in, in lots of projects on how to enhance biodiversity by using sensitive design in, in sea defences and you know, it, it's simple really you just got to make things sort of rough and pitted and it works um, this is a block which has been drilled in a certain way and, uh, and has been used on a breakwater and all the muscles have, 
settled, got into the groove. And this is where we were doing some work on grazing activity with little wax discs to measure radular rasps. And you know, when we finished the experiment, there were nice little homes for limpets. And these are some other holes for another experiment. This is a natural rock pool. So quite small interventions can make a huge increase in diversity. But trying to persuade engineers to do that is difficult because they like things to be nice and neat and tidy and, and smooth. But Louise Firth, who's a charming Irish lady, was really good at persuading engineers to do things like make rock pools in, in structures and, and explain that it wasn't going to affect the structural integrity at all. So you can do all sorts of post hoc interventions if you can persuade a man with a drill to make your rock pools. And um, this is our pierce de resistance, the bioblock, funded by the EU. And um, Louise and I designed this over the phone, um, you know, very high tech things, let's have a few grooves on the side, let's put a few pits on the side, and let's make some rock pools of different depth and, um, and dimension. And the idea was to do a perfectly replicated experiment on a new breakwater, we got the local council in Wales to agree to do this, the only problem was the mould broke after the first block. So uh, it was a good job Tony Underwood's retired. And secondly, we're going, to publish it in, we're going to publish it in Coastal Engineering anyway, because we can call it a prototype, and there's no worries about it, no replication. <laughs> so, just to finish off, I want to talk about interactions. Um, this Japanese seaweed is now dominant in rock pools. It came in with oysters in the 1970s. It's now everywhere. It's doing better and spreading faster in the last few years because it's warmer. This oyster here was introduced to Britain by the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food in the 1960s. And the man from the ministry said, there are no issues here because it's too cold for it to breed at the moment. And we're going to bring them in for hatchery culture and then they will be outplanted in the field and it's all going to be pucker and no problem at all. Of course it got warmer 10-15 years later and the little buggers have escaped everywhere. In Holland, they're forming huge reefs, have um, overtaken the mussel beds. They're sharp, they're pointy, they're not harvestable. And um, this is really an example of a non-native species doing really well because of a change in, in the climate and some very sloppy thinking in the 1960s about um, whether you should actually bring species in from elsewhere or not. So let's just think about how this will affect ecosystem functioning. And, you know, replacing one species of barnacle by another due to climate change, you could say what the functional effects of that are, but um, Semibalanus balanoides gets to the same, gets to a certain size in two weeks that takes the southern species nearly three years to get to. So the northern species are much, much more productive and there's lots of other indirect effects of that species. So there's some subtle quantitative effects. We've added a completely different barnacle, Elminius, which again is very productive, multiple brooder, so some subtle effects. But I think one of the most um, significant things is actually Crass Austria. On European shores, there are no midshore oysters. If you go to Australia or the Far East, there's midshore oysters everywhere. But that doesn't occur in Europe. And these oysters are now very, very common midshore, so it's a completely different functional group having a major effect on the way that particular um, system works. And that's a combination of sloppy husbandry coupled with warming facilitating spread. So let's just conclude a bit. So lots of changes, plankton fish, rocky shores, um, intertidal species are good cheap sentinels for changes offshore. We know what goes on with barnacles goes on with fish and they're good for modelling because we've got a lot of data about their ecology. There's major consequences for the structure and functioning of coastal ecosystems. And for me it's really important we do need these long term observations, we do need experiments and we do need modelling because we need all three approaches um, to make sure that we can better understand and probably move from forecast to prediction about what might occur in the future. Now, in the climate change policy and science community, the word adaptation means adapting to climate change. For some bizarre reason, mitigation means putting less stuff in the atmosphere. Um, but to adapt to climate change, we first of all need the ability to separate out 
low, low amplitude, long wavelength climate driven change from much more spiky regional local scale impacts. It's a real signal to noise problem. I don't think we can do anything much about climate change for the next 50 years because of the inertia in the system. We've got to strive to mitigate, we've got to think about new technologies, we've got to um, reduce our dependence on um, fossil fuels and, uh, and carbon. But until these new technologies and mitigation kick in, climate change is with us. So what we've got to do is manage the interactions of climate change with those things that we can control. And you know, an easy thing would be a bit of biosecurity. Um, I think non-native species is a global issue and it's certainly, they certainly do far better because many of these are generalists and they do better in a spiky, more extreme world and come in and do well. Um, obviously pelagic fishing is, is global but most fishing is, is, is regional and I think we, if we can manage fishing we need to manage its interaction with climate because um, climate change makes fish more susceptible to overfishing Overfishing makes fish more susceptible to climate change impacts because their resilience is lowered. There's less buffering capability. I think we can be positive about eutrophication, which is the input of nutrients into the sea. I think on both sides of the Atlantic, we've made huge advances over the last 20 or 30 years in reducing nutrient inputs. But where you do get eutrophication in warm weather, you tend to get toxic algal blooms and you tend to get um, uh, dead zones. So. I think we're making progress on that. At a local scale like Boston Bay, Boston Harbour, again, it, climate will make the effects of eutrophication worse. There's, more, there's greater likelihood of algal blooms. And similarly, point source pollution. So I think what we've got to focus on is doing the things that we, we can do. And one of the areas which I think is, is neglected is inappropriate coastal development which leads to habitat loss, habitat um, modification. And this is something where, with a bit more care, we can build in greater resilience to climate change. But one of the issues here is that actually in responding to climate change and defending our coasts, we're losing habitat. So our adaptation itself is causing impacts. So, you know, there's a few things you can do. And OK, bioblocks is not exactly rocket science, but you can actually make some nice, really cool little rock pools on the shore in urban environments. And it's amazing how important that is to kids and everybody in terms of appreciating um, their marine environment. Thank you very much for your attention.